Hello, welcome to the Friday, March 18th, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. The war in Ukraine is still dominating the news and also having its effect on network security topics. Uh, for example, the developer of the Node IPC package decided to add a new dependency to the module called Peace Not War, which apparently is overriding files of users that are located in Belarus or Russia. It started all harmless enough uh, with a warning message, but then later the code was modified again and now overwrites files uh, for systems located in Belarus and Russia with a simple heart symbol. Geolocation is done uh, by IP address and of course with uh, some of the ambiguities uh, in geolocation, this could potentially also affect users outside of the targeted area. What makes that also so significant is that the node IPC package is used by the view CLI package. And uh, Vue, of course, Vue.js is a major framework, very popular uh, by many developers. So uh, this is how uh, this particular alteration uh, was included in a number of projects. And the Peace Not War module apparently was downloaded about 30,000 times at a time when SNCC wrote up a great blog post with all the details and all the different modifications that these modules went through. The Node IPC package has now been marked as malicious, so hopefully uh, that'll uh, prevent any further fallout here. But since it is an important dependency, uh, marking as malicious uh, may also uh, cause other things uh, to break. I wouldn't be surprised to see more uh, packages published like that, in particular since this Peace Not War package is out there now. There is sort of a template to follow in order uh, to basically do the same thing that Node IPC did here. And in sort of another and somewhat expected development, uh, Facebook has found and removed a deep fake video of President Zelensky, where he essentially asked the Ukrainian military to lay down their arms. This was expected that things like this are going to pop up. I didn't uh, see the video myself, but was told it uh, looked uh, quite realistic. So certainly something that could at least cause some confusion. As with all fake news and such, if something is too much out of character, too unexpected, then uh, be careful and double check your sources where it came from. This particular video apparently is still spreading on various other social networking platforms. And Mangiant has an interesting blog post that was describing a rootkit that they found on ATM machines. Uh, this uses a couple of interesting backdoors, was written for uh, Unix environments, and also, well, uh, yet again, we just had it yesterday, is using DNS for a command and control channel. This is certainly a more sophisticated and, of course, financially motivated uh, attacker, but uh, these techniques tend to have their way of trickling down to lesser uh, malware and definitely important to stay ahead of it by reading up on some of these techniques. And the blog posted by Mandiant does a pretty good job helping you out here. And Microsoft released a tool to scan micro tick routers for vulnerabilities. Micro tick routers, like many of these routers, have uh, been heavily abused and have had, had a couple of uh, very uh, severe security vulnerabilities in the past. Now, what this tool does is it will uh, connect to the router. You have to provide it with credentials so it can actually log into the router. And then it looks for uh, some common indicators that are often present if the router has been compromised. It will also alert you if your firmware is up, out of date and uh, will basically tell you what vulnerabilities you may be exposed to as a result. Interesting tool and uh, wish uh, that Microtech, not Microsoft, uh, would have come up with a tool like that. 
Well, and it's Friday again, and with that, uh, we uh, do have another sans.edu student, Ron. Uh, Ron, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Ron Groman. Um, I've been working in information security now for close to 20 years. Uh, I've had more more vendor-specific certifications than I care to remember over that time. Uh, currently hold a CISSP, um, probably around seven or eight SAN certifications, and uh, I'm almost done with my master's program. And as part of the master's program, you had to write a research paper. And of course, that's what we want to talk about. It was sort of a little bit about the issues that pop up between OT, IT networks uh, in ICS. Can you explain a little bit what OT is, what IT is, and what some of the issues are that sort of pop up uh, between those two areas? Yeah, sure. You usually see these separations in anywhere that has uh, something like an industrial control system, uh, which is an ICS network. So, you know, any of your critical infrastructure, power, uh, uh, water, um, any of that kind of stuff, as long as every manufacturing industry out there has some, some element of this. Um, and the difference between IT and OT is your IT staff, your information technology staff, are those the ones setting up, you know, your email and servers and antivirus and all that kind of stuff. And then you have your OT staff, which is responsible for all of the uh, PLCs, all of the HMIs, the interactions between the machines and the humans, um, and everything that controls what actually happens with these production lines and, and industrial systems. So they, they really share one network in some ways, or but it's very different types of devices that are connected to that uh, single, I guess, IT network or IP network, I should say? Yeah, um, in most cases, there is some type of segmentation or, or segregation between the two uh, uh, areas. Uh, that varies from business to business, or sometimes there's federal regulations or other type of regulations that may force you to do it a certain way. Um, but generally speaking, uh, it's, like you said, a, a very different set of devices with uh, very different requirements um, using the same type of infrastructure. So for example, you know, as a, as a regular user, I could be sending email, you know, downloading stuff from the internet, doing whatever I need to from it. And I'm worried about transferring files with a lot of size, you know, a lot of data, um, on the OT side to draw a parallel to that, you've got systems transferring very, very large amounts of data, but it's happening in very small bursts. So instead of straight bandwidth being an issue, you've got latency that's a big issue in, in that area because that data has to get there right away. Yeah, and uh, your paper was really about uh, uh, network access control, which isn't really all that easy to do in the IT world, which I assume has a lot more experience with network access control than uh, the OT world. So how did you resolve some of these issues? What uh, what did you learn based by looking at how to implement a network access control in the OT world? What are some of the lessons from your paper? Yeah, so I mean, maybe I should uh, clarify at the beginning. You know, network access control is an element of, of something that you see, you know, a lot of out in the out in the wild right now. Those buzzwords people are using, like zero trust and, and stuff like that. It's all based on some level of network access control where you control. Uh, what happens, uh, so for instance, an endpoint, you know, you can check the user using the endpoint, the endpoint itself, where it's connecting from physically, where it's connecting from logically, what segment of the network, what time of day it is, um, what type of communication it uses, all of these things become conditions that then limit what it can access on the network to, to reduce the risk associated with that endpoint. Um, but some of the major things that, you know, we discuss is, is really those key differences. You know, we, we gave the example before of uh, the latency being one of the major differences in the types of devices. But there are several others um, that, that play into this uh, design consideration for network access control in an industrial environment. Um, it covers a lot of that. Uh, we also talk, I also talk about uh, how to get the OT staff to have ownership and take control of a lot of this process um, and some of the roadblocks that you would run into trying to force this type of thing on that environment without proper understanding and buy-in from an OT side of the, of the uh, uh, business. 
So essentially, if you talk to an IT person that has implemented some form of network access control uh, before, and that person now says, hey, you know, let me get this working for your OT network as well. Um, can you sort of point out some of the stumble blocks, kind of some of the issues that they may run into? Uh, well, first of all, you should you should plan to spend 80% of your time doing testing and planning and 20% of your time doing the actual implementation. Um, you, you really have to spend enough time to make sure that the OT side doesn't get defensive about it. Everything works good, you know, plan it out, work, do it in a very small, slow rollout, build some, some comfortability with the OT side. So they're, they're um, sure that you know what you're doing, that it's going to work, that they're capable of continuing to do their job, which is making sure the manufacturing lines continue to run um, without having to call, you know, somebody in the middle of the night to be able to fix an issue or resolve a safety issue because uh, something wasn't able to get fixed on the, on the industrial control network. Um, but a lot of the things you'll notice are, are things like I mentioned uh, or alluded to earlier with the different device requirements where um, you have to modify some of the safety controls that, or, or, or periodic checks that network access control does during an IT environment to make sure that there's no interruption to the function of the OT side of the house. So you're basically leaning on the entire network design to mitigate some of the risk of not doing those periodic checks uh, in favor of making sure the process, whatever it is that those devices are controlling, stays running all the time. And, uh, uh, you know, there, I even kind of talk about changing priorities of what type of authentication to use because of the age of some of those manufacturing devices. They're just not capable of using modern methods of authentication and then how to, how to take those, those legacy, I'll call them legacy or less secure methods of, of authentication and then using some other add-ons to the network access control process increase the confidence that you're granting the correct level of access to the devices you think you are even though they can't use the the better more modern methods to identify themselves so really you have to work a little bit around the limitations of those devices they're limited computing power and I assume also the kind of operating systems and so you find on those devices where you can't necessarily just install some random third-party software on those devices yeah I mean one of the key one of the keys to doing network access control and one of the most modern methods is 802.1x it's a you know it's a it's a challenge method for authentication where you present credentials or a certificate or something like that and um, and use that as a you know non-disputable way to identify who you are um, so there's 100% certainty what's connecting to the network. Well, these old devices, in most manufacturing environments, unless the, the actual plant was recently built, I guarantee they have equipment sitting out there for 10, 15 plus years. And when it was built, this type of thing was never even a thought in their mind. So it wasn't planned to have this there. You know, there's there's no mechanisms built in to use that. There's no way of adding those mechanisms. There's no actual OS running on the devices. It's just a, an, an I/O and input output device sitting there that's never meant to be logged into or or manipulated in that way. So you know, these are a whole bunch of challenges that you have to have to overcome. And you know, we talk I talk about that a bit in the paper as to how to how to overcome that and how to plan for those devices and and, and make sure that you're not gonna you're not going to break any of them, but you also don't really have to compromise on your rollout of network access control either. So that's great. Uh, I'll leave a link in the show notes so people can get a hold of your paper. Well, uh, thank you. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And talk to you again on Monday. Bye.